Thanks for tuning in. My name is John Hirschmiller. I'm a geologist at GLJ. Today, I will be talking about geothermal, what it is, where it's found, and how to extract it. GLJ is a global energy consulting company which has been in business for almost 50 years. Rooted in oil and gas consulting, GLJ has expanded its services over the last decades to provide support to all energy sectors from oil and gas, geothermal, carbon capture and storage to lithium extraction. GLJ provides services and independent analysis of geothermal heat and power projects, which range from geological and reservoir studies to economic forecasting and geothermal reserves and resources. We work with you and your company to accelerate corporate growth and to help progress geothermal development. At the end of 2019, there was about 15,000 megawatts of electrical geothermal production capacity in the world. Geothermal energy accounts for about 0.2% of the supply of electricity in the world. Currently, Canada has zero geothermal electricity capacity. However, there are a few projects in development which may get Canada to be a worldwide contributor for geothermal energy. Everyone thinks of Iceland as a poster child for geothermal energy. Iceland does have a large proportion of geothermal electricity capacity per capita. However, worldwide, Iceland is not one of the top producers. In the world, the United States, Indonesia, Philippines, and the Turkey are major geothermal players. So let's break down this presentation to see what we will be discussing today. First, we will define what geothermal is and its uses. Next, we are going to understand what geothermal is, and I like to simplify this and lump it into threes. Three different categories and three characteristics of each of these points. So we can simplify the three types of geological settings, three extraction technologies, and three types of power plants. We'll then talk about potential in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, discuss the basis of heat in place calculations and energy utilization, and to wrap it up, we'll discuss reserves and resource reporting. Geothermal can easily be defined by splitting the world up. Geo equals earth, thermal equals heat. We put those two together, and it's earth heat. So geothermal is the heat that is stored and generated within the earth. There's two main types of geothermal. There's geothermal energy, which is electricity, and there's geothermal heat, which is used for commercial and residential heating. Besides electricity and residential heating, there's many uses for geothermal. From agriculture to food processing, geothermal can be used in many industries as a clean and reliable source of heat. As shown on the chart on the right, there's a plethora of industries which utilize heat. In Canada and around the world, geothermal can be utilized as a clean energy source instead of using electricity or natural gas to provide heat to many of these industries, as temperatures required can be as low as 20 degrees Celsius. We're going to discuss what geothermal is. As mentioned before, we're going to group these into three. There's three types of geological settings, three types of extraction technologies, and three types of power plants. For the three geological settings, we can group these into three distinct settings. First, we will discuss hydrothermal or volcanic settings. These are geological settings with active volcanism or a proximal heat source. Examples of these will be volcanoes or rift valleys. The second will be sedimentary basins. For sedimentary basins, we are including porous or permeable sedimentary strata which hot fluids can be produced. The last type of geological setting is characterized as hot and deep. These hot rocks are typically very deep and difficult to produce as there is very little natural porosity and permeability. This geological setting would be considered as basement rocks or old deep intrusive rocks. Our first geological system we are talking about is hydrothermal or volcanic systems. Historically, they have been the most common type of geothermal system because there are very high temperatures at a relatively shallow depth that allows for substantial power generating capacities. These hydrothermal systems target hot reservoirs proximal to volcanoes or strata in a rift valley. They use hot geothermal fluids which have been heated by being in close proximity to volcanic activity. Volcanic geothermal systems harvest water or steam in the country rock which is proximal to volcanoes or the magma chambers. The geothermal reservoirs are in country rock which is composed of either sedimentary, fractured igneous, or metamorphic rocks and are ro or rocks located in fault zones. As seen in the image in blue, an optimal geothermal reservoir is situated far enough away from the magma chamber to avoid the considerable number of technical challenges that come with such proximity 
of the volcano, but close enough to provide high temperatures. Probably the most widely referenced hydrothermal field in the world is the largest geothermal in the world, which is the Geysers Geothermal Field in Northern California in the Napa Sonoma area. So now, if you're ever drinking wine in Sonoma, you can now think you're standing on the largest geothermal reservoir in the world. In the Geysers Field, there's a pluton which is intruded to the country rock. Above the pluton, the heat of the magma has superheated the reservoir to over 200 degrees Celsius and turned the reservoir water directly into steam. The production wells are drilled into this steam reservoir and are producing steam directly into their power plants. There are some fields in the world which are similar to this in active volcanism areas such as Kenya, Italy, Iceland, etc. The second most common geological setting for geothermal energy is sedimentary basins or hot sedimentary aquifers. Sedimentary basins are an underutilized resource as they are a lower temperature than hydrothermal systems. The lower temperature fluid of sedimentary basins requires a higher fluid rate to produce an equal power capacity of a higher temperature resource. However, technological advancements are making sedimentary basins more attractive for geothermal development. Generally, in sedimentary basins, temperature increases with depth. The change in temperature with depth is a geothermal gradient. The geothermal gradient varies due to many factors, but the primary control is usually proximity to a heat source, such as underlying hot basement rocks. By understanding the geothermal gradient, subsurface temperatures can be predicted if the basin's sedimentary thickness is known. A geothermal gradient can be calculated from the temperature measurements at various recorded depths. This data is commonly derived from well bore logging. The geothermal gradient can be calculated using the knowing temperature points at de and depths on the formula on the bottom left of this slide. On the map displayed on this sl slide, Limburger et al. in 2008 completed a worldwide study to understand the geothermal potential from sedimentary basins. They multiplied a geothermal gradient by the basin's thickness to calculate the maximum sedimentary aquifer temperature. The last type of geological system is hot and deep rocks. Geothermal projects are targeting deep, hot rocks which are generally very tight with low porosity and very low permeability. Rocks in these systems are usually basement rocks or are deep plutonic rocks. There are a few trials currently which are trying to exploit these hot and deep systems. They are planning to fracture these rocks to allow fluid to flow through their fractures. If successful, this could unleash immense possibility for geothermal and geothermal energies. Only restraint would then be the drilling capabilities to drill deep enough to access these reservoirs. For geothermal extraction technologies, we can group these into three distinct types. Conventional geothermal, enhanced geothermal, or engineered geothermal systems are modifying the reservoir to enhance geothermal production and advanced geothermal systems, which use new technologies such as conduction to extract heat from the subsurface. The first type of geothermal extraction technology we're discussing is conventional geothermal doublets. With these doublets, there's usually two or more wells drilled into a permeable reservoir. The reservoir can be fractured volcanic or metamorphic rock or permeable sedimentary rock. In a conventional geothermal systems, there are two roles of the wells. There's producer wells and injector wells. The producer well pumps or flows water from the formation into a power generating station or heat exchanger for thermal uses. The cooled water is then re-injected into the formation with the injector wells. That fluid heats up in the subsurface again and flows up the producer well, creating an open loop system in a subsurface by circulating the reservoir water. The second type of geothermal extraction technology is enhanced geothermal systems, or also known as engineered geothermal systems. As previously alluded to, EGS modifies the rock in the subsurface to create a fracture network to allow for fluids to flow through the fractures. There's a few trials worldwide which are experimenting with EGS. Targeting these hot and deep rocks, fracturing is needed. Cold water is pumped down into the formation. The temperature differential between the cold water and the hot, brittle rock, in theory, will fracture the rock and create a fracture network. This fracturing using cold water is commonly referred to as hydro shearing. In lower depths and temperatures, traditional hydraulic fracturing from oil and gas projects can be used to enhance or engineer permeability. 
EGS is produced then the same manner as conventional geothermal systems with producer wells and injector wells once this fracture network is initiated. The third type of geothermal system is advanced geothermal systems. These systems are commonly referred to as borehole heat exchangers. There are two companies with pilot projects where they are worthy of note, Ever Technologies and Greenfire Energy. Ever Technologies on the left has their Everlight demonstration facility near Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. Their demonstration facility showed that their technology is successful by being able to connect wells on the subsurface and flow fluid through the wells, which can be heated up via conduction underground. Ever is currently developing some different configurations of their multilaterals, including designs to be able to drill wells from all from one surface location. Ever has been recently in the news um, by being able to secure funding to build a commercial project. The second technology of, of note is Greenfire Energy with their Green Loop technology. Greenfire uses a monobore well which flows supercritical CO2 down a tube in the center of the well, and this supercritical CO2 comes back up the outside of the well bore, heating up on its way to the surface. Greenfire uses supercritical CO2 in their projects because it's a higher generating capacity than water. New conduction technologies or new advanced geothermal systems are continuing to be developed as they reduce the risk of finding a permeable zone which they have to produce water from, as they have no interaction rather besides heat transfer in the reservoir. The last pillar to understand the basics of geothermal are power plants. Power plant technologies can be simplified to be three different types of plants. These plants are categorized mostly due to the product which is being extracted from the subsurface. The first we'll talk about is flash steam. Flash steam can utilize steam, water, or both in their design. The hot fluids, which are extracted from the well bore, enter a separator. There is usually a large pressure difference between the pressure in the well or reservoir and the separator. This dramatic drop in pressure makes the hot water flash to steam as a boiling point changes rapidly under the pressure change. That steam is then captured and fed into a turbine to generate electricity. The second type of plant is dry steam plants. These plants utilize steam directly from the subsurface, such as in the geyser field in California. The steam directly flows into the turbine, which generates electricity. The steam is then cooled, and this cooled steam, now water, is re-injected back into the subsurface. The last type of plant is binary cycle plant, or also referred to as organic ring of cycle plants, or ORC plants. Binary cycle plants utilize only hot water for their plants. The hot water flows into a heat exchanger, which heats up a secondary liquid such as isobutane, which has a much lower boiling point. The isobutane vapor is then used to run the turbine. The cooled water after leaving the heat exchanger is then re-injected into the subsurface. Due to the secondary fluid use, temperatures for power generating can be as low as 60 degrees Celsius, which allows for electricity generation in low temperature environments such as sedimentary basins. The three pillars of geothermal and their three subcategories can be all put on one general diagram. This diagram is set up as a chart with temperature on the x-axis and depth on the y-axis. As geothermal gradient is defined by an increase of temperature with depth, average geothermal gradients can be plotted on the graph to help show where there's a different geological settings land. We plotted the sedimentary basins, hydrothermal and volcanic geological settings, as well as hot and deep systems on the chart based on their temperature and depth ranges. Under the headers of these geological settings, we have put a summary of what these settings include and what type of technologies can be used to extract the geothermal resource. Along the top of the chart, we have also plotted the plant types and the preferred ranges in temperature which they can be utilized. With this diagram, we can understand based solely on depth and temperature what kind of geological setting we may be in, what kind of extraction technology we can use, and what type of plant we would need. As we've discussed the basis of geothermal and geothermal energy, we're going to briefly talk about the geothermal potential in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. The first thing we can use to understand the geothermal potential for the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, or any basin worldwide, is to understand and calculate a geothermal gradient. We've taken temperature points across the basin for over a million wells from bottom pole temperatures from oil and gas wireline logs. 
As both bottom hole temperatures from logs are not in equilibrium yet, we applied a correction to wireline log data, which was derived from the difference in temperatures taken from well test data and wireline temperatures. In the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, the geothermal gradient ranged from about 20 to 45 degrees Celsius per kilometer. We want to understand what the maximum temperature which we can achieve in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. By doing this, we can rearrange the formula that was on the previous slide for geothermal gradient and multiply the geothermal gradient by the depth to the basin's basement. On the map of the right is a result of this calculation, multiplying geothermal gradient by thickness and adding surface temperature to it. In the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, there is temperatures in the west along the foothills and in the Liard basin, which reach close to 200 degrees Celsius at depths around 5 kilometers. Another area that's worthy of note is the Williston Basin in southern Saskatchewan. There's a high geothermal gradient, which allows for temperatures to reach over 120 degrees Celsius at only at depths of 3 kilometers. By looking at this map, it really shows that there's geothermal potential for electricity in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, as well as immense opportunities for geothermal heat projects in Canada. Temperature is not everything. We need to understand what temperature translates to in terms of something useful. Temperature is one thing, but extractable energy, either in megawatts or kilojoules, is something management, investors, and the general public can put their minds around. If you or your company is trying to understand what a potential project's opportunities and value is, GLJ is an industry leader in this space and would love to have a conversation with you. We can help to understand the amount of energy which is available and the value of that energy which can be extracted. Projects could be from either from an electrical power generating project to commercial heat project or even looking at opportunities for utilizing water which is co-produced from oil and gas wells. The most common way of understanding what the energy potential underground is, is by calculating it volumetrically, similar to how it's done in the oil and gas and mineral and exploration and mining industries. The first term which is important to calculate is thermal energy. Thermal energy can be calculated with the formula at the top of the slide. The formula uses the rock volume, fluid volume, as well as their specific heat capacities and reservoir temperature. Once we understand what energy is available underground, we need to understand what energy can be extracted and used for work. A few modifying factors are applied to the calculation, such as recovery factory of the heat underground, as well as the change in enthalpy and entropy of the water or brine which is brought to surface. By applying these modifying factors results in a term called exergy. Exergy is the usable thermal energy which is usually reported in megajoules or kilojoules. To understand what the megawatt potential of a project is, we have to divide the exergy by time to get a value in megawatts. Directly dividing exergy by time will result in thermal energy value which is used for heat. To calculate the electrical equivalent, multiplying exergy first by electrical utilization factor or a plant efficiency factor before dividing it by time. GLJ has created a probabilistic Monte Carlo simulation to allow for varied inputs to statistically calculate a range of probabilities for the amount of thermal and electrical energy for a project. If you are wanting to understand what the geothermal potential is of a property and a distribution of what the potential would be, we would be happy to discuss how GLJ can help. The amount of fluid produced is another key topic to understand how many wells will be needed to produce the amount of water required for a project. A study by Sandel and Butler in 2010 created an empirical correlation using geothermal plant capacities, their fluid temperatures, and flow rates. The relationship can be used to estimate power generation potential based on reservoir temperature, assuming a constant flow rate. In Canada, projects which are being developed are usually quoting that a 5 megawatt facility could be constructed. Based on this empirical relationship, projects in Western Canada with a water temperature around 120 degrees Celsius will require about 160,000 barrels of water per day to generate that 5 megawatts of energy. This is a tremendous amount of water with some geological information and basic engineering principles. An estimate of theoretical flow rates can be completed. 
We can estimate these flow rates by using some reservoir engineering principles and equations such as the classical two-dimension diffusion equation by Carslow and Yager in 1947. With this formula, it utilizes some basic engineering parameters and reservoir parameters such as well pressure, the diameter of the well bore, height of the produced zone, and reservoir permeability. In general, higher flow rates are achieved when reservoir pressure is higher, thicker reservoir is available, and most of all, there's higher permeabilities. It's quite important to understand the potential flow rates because by having a higher flow rate, less wells are needed for a project, which in turn helps the bottom line of the economics for that project. As mentioned before, GLJ has developed a probabilistic Monte Carlo simulation to estimate heat in place as well as potential flow rates of wells. Shown on this slide is an example of a generic output from the model. It allows for a range of inputs for both heat in place modeling as well as flow rate modeling. If you are interested in finding out the geothermal potential of a project, we at GLJ will be delighted to work with you to put your data into our model to give you an understanding of heat in place as well as potential flow rate rates you may achieve. Understanding the potential is one thing to say, yes, there's a resource here, but understanding the economics is critical as well. At GLJ, we work with our clients to understand the technical aspects of projects and translate it to a dollar amount. Understanding the value of a project is critical to companies to build investor confidence. Please reach out to us to see how we can help. Besides understanding and calculating heat in place and flow rates, geothermal can be disclosed by companies as a reserve or resource. These reserve and resources can bring an economic value to the company's bottom line. Geothermal reserve and resource reporting uses a similar nomenclature as both oil and gas and the mining industries. Two main reporting codes exist, the United Nations Framework for Classification for Geothermal Resources, as well as the CANGIA Canadian Geothermal Code for Public Reporting. Both of these codes follow a similar path with reserves and resources. With more confidence and knowledge of a project, the path moves from exploration results into reserve resources and eventually reserves. Unlike resources, reserves usually are considered producing assets for, or a financial commitment to develop a project is established. GLJ will be happy to discuss your project and where it lies in the reserve and resource reporting realm and how a reserve and resource report can help with financing and funding future projects. Geothermal energy is an underutilized resource which has great potential for reliable base load power and heat. There is a strong potential for geothermal in Canada along the foothills and in the Liard and Williston basins for electricity and elsewhere in the basin for heat. Understanding geothermal resources is more than just calculating reservoir temperature. We need to understand heat in place as well as what kind of flow rates can be achieved. We need to also understand what kind of technologies can be implemented such as advanced geothermal technologies if flow rates are not sustainable naturally. It is also important for us to understand geothermal and its economic implications as it can help create investor confidence and raise capital. GLJ will be happy to discuss any projects and how we may be able to help you. Thanks for listening. If you require any additional information or clarification on geothermal, please reach out. Myself and GLJ will be happy to discuss any geothermal projects you may have and how GLJ can work with you and support you and your organization to bring those projects to completion.